Of all sea fish, the bass is the most highly prized by anglers. Sadly, it is a fish with a price on its head, and in recent years, the inshore stocks of bass have been severely overfished, with smaller fish being the main target of commercial fishermen. Nowadays, every harbour and quay is littered with the most serious threat to inshore bass, the monophyll gill net. Many of the netsmen have moved away from traditional lobster and crab potting into the more lucrative trade of inshore gill netting. The relatively low cost of a net is usually recovered a dozen times over if just a few medium-sized bass are caught each trip. Despite all this, it's now a fact that there are fewer big bass to be caught these days. Even as recently as the mid-80s, there were enough to provide fantastic sport. These fish represent a small number of those caught on my local patch during the 70s and early 80s. Now, if we catch one or two decent fish in a season, we consider that we've done well. All of this means that if you're going to be successful nowadays, you must adopt a specialist approach. Join us for just a few of the many trips that we make each year in search of bass. The keen bass angler needs to be an early riser, as without doubt the best time to fish is at first light. After an early start, a brisk hike along the shore helps to blow away the cobwebs. The bass is an active predator, searching the shoreline for its prey. Whilst hunting, they use the changing light conditions to their advantage. Many of the small fishes of the tidal zone, pipefish, blennies, etc., will still be lethargic from their overnight rest, and the larger bass that feed on these creatures will be lurking amongst the weed-covered boulders, ready to lunge out to seize the unsuspecting. The very edge of the shoreline, amongst the snags and cover, where their food is, is where you should place your bait or lure. Bass are also opportunists and will feed readily wherever food is abundant. This could be larger prey, such as fish, squid and cuttle, or crabs. Or it could be smaller items, such as shoals of fry, Slaters and beach hoppers, and the maggots of the seaweed fly. A 
as long as they can expend the minimum amount of energy in order to feed, bass will be present and often predict, it seems, where their food is to be found. If you too can predict these concentrations of bass grub, you're in with a chance. An example of such a place is Flat Ledge. It's proven very reliable over the years and fishes best for a few days in early summer each season. On the same spring tides, give or take a week or two, migrating shoals of sand hills move in their millions past the ledge. They're swept close inshore by the strong spring tides and the bass move in for the kill. The ledge is also exposed to the prevailing winds and the combination of wind and tide usually produces spectacular surf. At times, bass can be seen chasing sand hills through the waves. At other times, they can't wheel out of the sea well beyond casting range. We're using floating cloaks to imitate the sand eels. Fished on medium cart rods and fixed bull reels, it's possible to cast these light lures weighing between a quarter and half an ounce to the feeding fish. A cart rod also enables us to hook and play out any bass that swims in the seething foam. With the sea at its coldest following the winter months, warm clothing and good waterproofs are essential. During the course of the next three days, the wind dropped away and the surf subsided. We fished each morning, anticipating the arrival of the sand eels and with them, the bass. With the improvement in conditions, we were joined by our mate Stuart Clough. At low water, the bass could be seen ripping into their quarry carrying and chasing amongst the kelp beds. We changed from the larger plugs that we had been using to smaller single-bodied or jointed plugs of two to three inches to match more accurately the size of the sand hills that were spraying in panic to avoid their attackers. Stuart was the first to connect.
Any sides, is it? It's not huge. Getting up in the morning for there. Yeah. You've got to have the hooks really sharp, haven't you? You do. Mind you, once they go past the barbs, they can be a bugger to get out. Yeah. As I see. Oh, there you go. It's a lovely fat little fish, that, isn't it? Not eh? a huge fish, but... Uh, no. Every fish is a bonus nowadays. Certainly is, Steve. It's low tide on this flat, rocky ledge. In fact, the tide's just starting to come in now, but you can see all these little rock pools with uh, tufty sort of rack and uh, uh, small bits of uh, coralline weed and things. And here and there you've got the odd bull. Now, these pools absolutely seethe you like. Full of, uh, full of fry and prawns and crabs. Blennies. Um, so even though it looks a bit like a sort of rocky desert, you get the uh, the bass and the wrasse coming in over here as the tide comes in and looking for all these small fish and other animals. So if you're ever stuck for bait, really all you need to do is turn over one or two rocks. And I expect here's a little pool. I expect if we turn this rock over, we'll find something underneath here that we could use for a bait. Oops, and there they are, look at them. Three, at least three, four, four good bass baits there. So let's see if we can catch one. Easier said than done. And there he is, look, jaws agape, all ready to bite me. Ah, and he has done. God, it can nip a bit, doesn't it? Later in the season, the rock pools offer protection for this year's baby mullet and bass. It's not an easy existence for the fry, who have to be able to withstand the fluctuating water temperatures and the increased salinity due to evaporation. One, one mullet, is it? There's one, There's mullet, one mullet, two bass. Just in the centre of the picture there, and then yeah. two bass. They're quite distinct, though, aren't they? Yeah. That's this year's bass, I suppose, is it? This year's Must spawn? be this year's, yeah. Yeah. They call O group. So they'll have spawned in, I don't know, April or something like that. Yeah. And now by August they've reached, what, what are they? Just a bit over an inch maybe? long, yeah. about yeah. an inch long. The Twenty pounders of uh, yeah, of, of twenty years, years time or something like that. Yeah. Twenty five years. Got a lot, lot of trials and tribulations to certainly have to go through before. And the same with the mullet, Steve. I mean, it well, took yeah. a hell of a long time to get any size. That'll be this year's mullet as well. Mm. It's interesting. They're roughly the same sort of size. They are. Yeah. So yeah. I suppose the. The mullet probably spawn in the spring as well. I don't think anybody really knows too much about mullet now. 
Let's let him go then, eh? Okay. Fry are also food for their older brothers and sisters, which can often be taken on fry imitation, fished on trout gear. <laughs> Lovely job. Larger bass are sometimes caught as this eight-pounder of Mike's testifies. Our good friend Alan Vaughan has brought us to one of his favourite marks, Sheltered Ledge, to give us a few tips on collecting peeler crab and how to use them for bait. Alan is a bass angler of vast experience. He is one of only a handful of anglers who have caught ten double-figure bass from the shore. A truly remarkable achievement. He's also the co-author, with Mike, of the original book, Hooked on Bass. Right, well, we're in business now because this is a little female that's a peeler. We can tell it for two reasons. We can see her shell cracking here, and we can confirm it by loosening one of the segments of the legs and pulling, and we can see the new shell jelly soft underneath. Quite easy to tell all crab sexes. They're all more or less the same short crabs, edible crabs, and velvet crabs. The male's got a pointed abdomen and the female's got a wider, more rounded abdomen. You can see that quite clearly here. This female's a peeler. This one happens to be a softy. This male. One velvet fiddler crab. It's a male, with a pointed abdomen. Always aggressive, as usual. And it's a peeler. I just put this back steep as, as near as I can to where it was before to make sure that any crabs that want to go back underneath can leave the habitat as it was. It isn't long before we have enough bait for a two hour session. For sure, crabs, I always reckon that. One's not really enough, so I put a couple on. First of all, I anchor one on. This happens to be a slightly crisp softy. Anchor that one on with an elastic band first. And then I should just finish it off with a peeler. It doesn't really matter whether you leave the claws and the legs on a small one or not for bass. Sometimes it makes a neater bait if you take the legs and claws off. It's quite soft underneath, isn't it? Yes, this one's ready to peel, so it's easy to get the shell off, and of course it is soft. I think I'll take the claws off and leave the legs on. It's a bit like shelling a hard-boiled egg. <laughs> Simply fasten the, the second one to the, um, the first one. And you've opened the gape of that hook very slightly, I've have you? I've opened the gape a bit, yeah, with pliers. Um, well, that's a very average sort of bait. There's nothing special. It'll catch bass, but if uh, if I had plenty of bait, I'd probably put a uh, slightly bigger one on for running the mill bass fishing. There it is. Doesn't matter what it looks like, as long as the, the crab's well bound onto the hook and uh, the hook points well out. 
Bass knows around places such as this for vulnerable crabs in the process of molting. When ledgering close in for big bass, it's important to hold the rod and to feel for bites. Alan points the rod straight at the bait, with the line as tight as possible. He senses the slightest movement in the line. Any variation in tension or direction of the line, a twitch or a pull, may indicate the presence of a fish, so the utmost concentration is called for. Bass don't always pull the rod over with a thumb, so be prepared to give slack line if you think that a fish is out there. Mike has a slightly different method of bite detection. He holds the rod just as Alan does, but he pulls a couple of feet of line off of the spool of his reel and holds this gently between fingers and thumb. This spare line is released if he gets a run. And he only strikes when the slack line is pulled tight by the taking fish. Different tactics, different methods, each has his own favourite. But one of the pleasures of angling is comparing experiences and hopefully learning from each other. Using peeler crab in daylight is an open invitation to rats. It's perhaps better to fish after dark if they're a pest. Beautiful fish, isn't it? Nice smashing. When fishing at night, it's best to keep the use of lights to an absolute minimum. Tilly lamps are definitely out, as the bass may be very close in. A small torch, or even better, a headlamp, provides enough light for tying hooks and baiting up. Even then, take care not to let the light shine on the water. Your eyes soon become accustomed to the gloom, and after all, you're feeling for bites. If you prefer to watch your rod tip, you can use a starlight or whatever natural light is available. We catch bass in all sorts of situations, from boulder-strewn shores to shingle beaches, and our tackle has to cope with everything from raging surf to flat, calm seas. One of the most important items is the line, which is your only connection to the fish. No doubt about it. Um, so, eight pounds what I use, I guess you've got about the same on your... Yeah, I've generally sort of taken your advice over the years and use, use what you use, yeah. I, I must admit, but I certainly wouldn't like to go much lower than that. No. You're, you're risking either uh, losing lots of plugs on, on snags or even losing a fish, maybe. Yeah, that's right. you know, it's so not so much that the, you couldn't, I mean, you know, if you know what you're doing, you could land a fish on five or six pound line without too much yeah. trouble. Yeah. But uh, if it's had a sort of rub on a rock or a barnacle or something like that and it's been yeah. weakened a bit, then, you know, you're good. Right. And well, usually, if it Pull free from a bit of rack, oh, which yeah. you in inevitably you hook them every trip, these sort of things, then six pound line's not man enough for it really. Eight will pull the load. Surprising load the difference that extra two yeah, pounds makes. Yeah. 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 yeah, that's right. So that's the rod, reel and line basically, and I think uh, it doesn't matter too much what make they are or exactly how big they are. It's yeah. the sort of thing that uh, uh, you've got to feel comfortable with yourself. And so 
rods between nine and twelve foot long, I suppose. Uh, but pound and a half test curve, pound three quarters test curve, that sort of thing. Mm. Um, are really suitable for most circumstances. Yeah. Fishing I think reliability, perhaps, is, and yeah. and, uh, and robustness is is the the key word for. Um, for reels, anyway. Yeah. Well, a clutch is a key uh, thing, I think, when you're spinning. Oh, without doubt. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you, you get a, a, a decent fish, hook a plug. You, you want to, you know, you want a clutch which is going to give yeah. rather than part the line. Yeah. And uh, if it's all caked up with salt or never worked in the first place, yeah. then uh, you're asking for either lots of lost, lost lures or even lost fish. Uh, okay. and, and, I mean, usually I, I set the, the clutch so that it's set that I can hook a fish. There's just enough power there yeah. to hook, That's but right. then the fish can it run if it wants give. to. Yeah, yeah. It's essential, yeah. So you want some resistance to set the hooks on the thing. Uh, well, otherwise you'll end up with a very lightly yeah. hooked fish which can come off at any time. That's right. and I suppose talking about hooks um, brings us a matter of the business what end. sort of yeah. lure to have on the end, doesn't it? And uh, a lot of the fishing I do is with buoyant or floating plugs, and this is probably the commonest, most popular uh, uh, of these, the J11 Rapala. Uh, one joint in the middle, two hooks, and a little ring at the front for attaching the uh, the line or the, uh, the the clip that you use to fix it on. And uh, they float on the surface. When you wind in, the vein takes them down a foot or 18 inches. It won't fish much deep, and doesn't matter how. Yeah hard your wine for bass fishing but as I say this is probably the the most popular one um, you can get a bigger bigger and smaller versions of this yeah uh, the bigger one will cast quite a long way about sort of 40 yards I suppose so you would be lucky to get this more than 25 or, or 30 yards but usually that's enough isn't it yeah. yeah when you've got a headwind it, it can be a problem of course if, if you think the fish are just beyond your reach sort yeah. of thing and uh, the wind in your face, then these are probably not the things to use. You probably want some with a bit more weight to it. Maybe some of the uh, some of the American lures that are made of, of quite dense plastic. It amazes yeah. me how they float, yeah, they but they still, they still float. float yeah. They? yeah, that's right. But uh, rebels, bombers, yeah. mans, yeah. headans. Yeah. Nils Master, that's another yeah. Finnish one. Uh, yeah. uh, made of wood, but heavier, denser than right. than these yeah. are. So I suppose uh, somebody might ask if. Uh, if you can get lures that do the same job and cast further, why not use them all the time? I yeah. mean, why, why bother with one of these? Well, I think the thing about um, the Rapala is that it's got a good action straight out the box, just like it says on, 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 yeah. the, on the box, in fact. So you can absolutely rely on these things working. And in truth, I suppose, it's a matter of lure you've got confidence in. So it doesn't really matter That's a which key of factor, these makes, it, yeah. if you've got confidence. Yeah. And, I know that, that these things will catch fish if there, are, if there are fish there that are liable to take. They don't always take, of yeah. course, whatever you're using, <laughs> but uh, these things are very reliable. And as far as I'm concerned, I, I tend to use this one more than anything. Yeah. But I switch to Rebels and, and Bombers. And now, now that, that one's blue on the back with a silver flank. Yeah. Uh, is that the only colour that you use? Uh, no, I suppose it's the one I use most commonly. I also use the gold ones. I don't bother too much about the colour of the back, but I think they tend to make the, them in uh, black and blue are the, are the sort of ones you normally see in the shop. Um, I don't think it matters too much what the mm. colour is. That's my normal view of this. Um, there are two sorts of fish in the, in the sea in, in my book. Really. There are ones that swim near the surface that are silvery, that look a bit like this. So you have things like herring, sprats, sand eels, sand smelts, mackerel, uh, mullet, you know, young mullet, things like that. All the sort of things bass might eat that are long, thin, silvery fish. And then you've got others that are camouflaged, like weed or rocks, or blennies, gobies, wrasse and so on, yeah. tend to be browns and greens. So you, if you've got those two different types, you know, the, the silvery or, or gold type and the uh, duller brown or green camouflage type, then you've probably covered most eventualities, yeah. I think. I mean, some of the American manufacturers go to extraordinary lengths to impregnate scales and, and fins. I mean, I've got a few in the, in the box here. Uh, when you look at some of these, some of these rebels, yeah. I mean, they're, they're extraordinarily realistic. 
every scale the is there. You've got uh, Even fins. Rays look, yeah, yeah, yeah. Gill covers, uh, a red eye. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so there's that one. There's there's another one there, which is once yeah. again very realistic. Yeah. Uh, and you mentioned ras earlier. I mean that's a yeah. a perfect example of a of a ras. Yeah. Uh, I doubt very much whether any bass that's going to take a lure has time to come up and look and see. Oh, that one's got scales and the, and the fins and so on. I don't think it probably makes that much difference. But they get an impression, I suspect, of movement yeah. and colour and size, and that says food, so they take it. And, and, and what else have you got in the box then, Steve? I suppose that's the sort of critical thing. What do you normally take with you when you go fishing? Ah, good question. Well, to be honest, although there's several lures in this box from all of the major manufacturers, truth to tell, I only use a couple. Yeah. Single um, plugs. Uh, do you think that makes any difference? Well, surprisingly enough, if you take well, these two, if I can disentangle them all, um, two lures from, from Bomber. Yeah. Uh, one is, is jointed yeah. uh, and one is, is a, a straightforward single body. There isn't a great deal of difference in, in, in the action, in fact. No. There's a bit more tail wiggle in that, yeah. but, but the overall action in, is, is more accentuated in that the whole thing moves, yeah. whereas with that one, just the, just the tail moves. Yeah. A tiny link swivel allows a quick lure change and doesn't impede the vigorous action of even a small Rapala, or for that matter, the lazy wiggle of a bomber or a Nils Master. Yeah, I mean, you don't need to tramp along the, the beach with no. 250 quid's worth of laws in a cantilever no, tray. No, no. Well, mine's the same. I mean, I've got exactly the same, so I'm sure you find that my laws are just like yours. So I've got uh, one or two big Rapalas. Uh, there's the 13 centimetre one there, which casts as well as anything, you know, sort of 40 yards. Nils Master that will cast even further. Uh, they both fish probably about the same depth. They both go down three or four feet, these mm. lures, when you're fishing with them. So, uh, but I think both nice pollock looking lures. They are, yeah. Those, I yeah. And if the fish are fry feeding, I might go to a little tiny rapala like that. And uh, it doesn't mean, you don't, like you say, it doesn't mean you don't catch big fish on them. I mean, no. uh, I've had double figure fish on, on, on these. Uh, yeah. Things are only what a couple of inches long, I suppose. I remember Dave had a was it a 13 pounder yeah, a few years right. back on a tiny little Nils Master, wasn't it? Like that. Yeah, that's right. And then, uh, well, in fact, not me. See, uh, they're all sharp these things, but I would sharpen them before I use them anyway. I've got, I think, I've a few of these sort of things, little, uh, little fat green and brown. Oh, jobs, rat so, imitators, yeah. Yeah, yeah. crayfish imitators, you see. Um, and uh, they work as well, of course. And most of these dive a bit deeper than the than the long thin plugs they've got that I use. Broader lips, haven't yeah, they? Yeah, and, and shallower sort of yeah. angle on them. And they tend to go down fairly deep. So you to fish them with circumspection's the word I think when there's a lot of snags about. Uh, Bass are not the only fish that will take plugs over snaggy ground. These lures tend to select for the larger wrasse, like this four pound ballon. Shall I pop him back in there? Well, there you go. Proof that big balance can be caught on plugs. In return. Well, I suppose this is every bass angler's nightmare, this, isn't it? Uh, gill net set in a few feet of water, just yards from the shore. Of course, that's where the bass are. 
and uh, quite small mesh so I suppose even if they're not takeable sized fish if they get hung in this they've, they've as good as had it really haven't they and in this shallow water the net hangs slack so uh, I would think almost anything to get caught in it really Even when there's no to catch, there are often indications for the observant angler. I'm surprised nothing's here eating them. Birds or something like that, yeah. Well, if uh, fish concentrate where there's plenty for them to eat, then uh, this is certainly the spot for bass. In a video we did before about mullet fishing, we showed that uh, mullet tend to concentrate where there's lots of food in the form of maggots. And uh, bass are no different, they'll come where there's plenty for them to eat. And uh, one of the things they eat is these marine wood lice, I think called Idatea. And here where you've got all this fine weed washed up from by. Uh, uh, storms of previous periods then the wood lice collect to feed on the dead weed and uh, as you can see all this in front of me is just a carpet of uh, carpet of wood lice when the tide comes in the bass come with it and gobble down these wood lice now the, the only problem about that is actually catching the things because they're fairly small to use for bait these things and really we've not found a, a way of doing that effectively because if you try to imitate them with a fly or something then uh, the fly gets caught up in the bits of weed and it's very difficult to fish so probably the best thing is to try an alternative method using a, a normal type of bass bait, squid or crab or fish or even use an artificial and, uh, both them sort of methods are successful up to a point, but uh, I think it's true to say we've not really cracked it. Uh, although we've caught perhaps two or three fish on occasions, it's uh, very rare to uh, really get the things in any numbers in a situation like this where they're preoccupied with food. Still, it's nice to know that there's some in here for them to eat and that they're likely to turn up to feed on it. When the tide rises, either tear swim among the washed up kelp, and the bass, and sometimes mullet too, will grovel around in the margins, gorging themselves. with circumspection is the word I think when there's a lot of snags about. Uh, oh and of course the critical thing which uh, I guess is in both our box, in fact I got two of them in here somewhere, but uh, a sharpening stone, yeah. all a sharp though. It just isn't worth getting a bite on your first cast with a blunt hook is it really? That's right. If you contact rocks or ledges or anything like that yeah. it's, it's easy to turn over the point of the hook. Uh, one or two other bits and pieces, you know a few little floats or cork 
whoops, chucking it away, corks that I can use for uh, if I want to fish a live prone or a blenny yeah. or something like that when yeah. uh, uh, when the lures fail, as they occasionally do. Or, uh, like you again, some heavy lures, you know, for uh, for casting a long way, you know, right. tobies and things like that. So you touched on, on yeah. bait fishing very briefly there with, with the yeah. float. Yeah. I would do an opportunity to move on to the tackle yeah, rods and reels for, for bait fishing, really. Well, we both, I mean, although, again, you know, we do a lot of plug fishing, we use bait as and when we think it's necessary and appropriate, don't we? You know, and it catch, you catch a lot. I think you catch bigger fish on bait as an average uh, than you do on on lures. At least if you use decent sized baits, you can well, that's catch bigger fish. That's the important factor, isn't that's it? Right. Yeah. So rods, I mean, you... Well, let's have a look at yours, Steve, because you're uh, pretty well set up for that, I think. Yeah, I think it'd be true to say that I, I divide my time sort of 50% between lure fishing and 50% yeah. between between bottom fishing. Uh, once again, it's a carp rod, or it was made for carp fishing, I should say. Yeah. Uh, that's what it said on the rod before it wore off. This particular rod, it's a bit heavier. Uh, like you with with, with the lures, I use a, a, light, a light carp rod. This is, I suppose, what you call a stepped up carp rod, yeah. or stepped up pike rod. Yeah. It's over two and a half pounds in test curve. So it's certainly got a bit of backbone yeah. so to it. So you could cast an ounce or two if you had to with that. Uh, I've cast about three ounces yeah. with it, but you've got to be very, very careful. Uh, for close in work, in, in rough weather, three ounces is yeah. what you need to, to hold bottom. Although, more often than not, I use about half an ounce of lead. Yeah. If circumstances will allow, if it's, uh, if it's not too yeah. rough and there's not too much tide. So the rod itself is 11 foot long. It's about uh, two and three quarter pound test curve, I think. And, uh, it's of carbon, so it's quite light. And the reel's not much different to the one on the other rod, really, is it, that you use for spinning? I mean, it's uh, Well, you could use both reels for, for either e either type of fishing. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I used the old Mitchell 410 for, for many years, and what I used to do there was when I was either freelining or fishing very close in, is open up the bail arm and just fill yeah. for bites. Yeah. And then when I had a bite, not the bail arm over, but technology has advanced uh, somewhat, and uh, I invested, I suppose would be the word, in, in, in one of the more modern, up-to-date, carbon-bodied reels, so there's no problems with corrosion there, yeah. uh, with a, a bait runner device. Um, it, it fits on the, on the rod very nicely. It's a good balanced outfit that way. And the, uh, the clutch is minutely adjustable, yeah. or infinitely yeah. adjustable. Uh, the Just bait, as important when you're bait fishing as yeah. you're spinning. Really. Oh, that's right. The bait runner allows you to cast out and then click that little lever over and it just minimises the drag and the fish can take with very minimal resistance. Yeah. Uh, generally, if, I, if it's taken a yard of line and it's, it's a confident run, I knock it over into gear yeah. Yeah. and then strike. You've got to remember to obviously... Does it automatically re-engage then when you do that? Well, that, it, that bait runner? it will do. Uh, but you, you've got to time it right. It's no good yeah. striking before you've hit the hit the right, bait runner right, over. Right, right. So that's a now, bit stronger line than you use for spinning, though. Well, that's 15 pound line on there. Yeah, Once again, you yeah. you need to take out a bit of insurance. You're fishing on the bottom in fairly inhospitable conditions, in between uh, boulders and on, on ledges. Yeah. You you need that not for the casting power because you, you're just flicking baits out normally. Yeah. But you do need a little bit of extra robustness in the line in order to ensure that you, you're not uh, sort of cracking off, uh, yeah. you know, on strikes and things like that. And I suppose you've got what you've got to do is set a hook, a biggish hook, well, that's, with a big lump of bait on it. Which that's is the other thing. To hamper the, the hook going in. Isn't yeah, it? if you're looking at uh, if you're looking at the business end, at the hook. Uh, now What's that's that, a six o or a four o. Well, that's a six o. It's yeah. it's quite a small. In my opinion, it's quite a small hook for, for, for bass fishing. Um, you could go smaller. You could use maybe a, uh, a hook specifically designed for, for bass fishing by one yeah. of the, the major manufacturers, like Breakaway, maybe. Yeah. Uh, in fact, this is a, a spear point hook made by Breakaway. Its, its size is for cod fishing, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I find it's an ideal hook it's just about the right length of the shank. It's got a nice knee tie, a nice yeah. small eye. It's, it's not a, 
a huge hook as far as the bend is concerned. I mean, some of the Viking patterns yeah. that you use are a bit bigger yeah. than that, a bit yeah. metre in the wire as well. Yeah. But it's certainly a, a hook which is strong enough to cope with, yeah. to gain virtually any bass well, that swims. you've found it a very effective uh, uh, the, hook, haven't you? That? The thing I like about it is, is the fact that it is very sharp when you get it out of the packet. Yeah. You don't have to worry about touching it up at all. It's been a mess. The hook's not very different to yours. It's a Viking in this case, which I've actually opened out a bit with a yeah. pair of pliers. That's about the only major difference, actually, the hook, isn't it? You know, yeah. Breaking strain line, rods, reels, all That's about the right. same. 15 pound line again. How long's the trace? Not much different. Yeah, about to three, yours, or, three or four, four foot, foot. Yeah. Foot, yeah. Uh, that gives you a bit of the bait, a bit of movement. I yeah. always feel gives the fish a chance to pick it up without feeling the lead instantly. And uh, the hook looks much the same as the one on yours, I guess, Steve, doesn't it? Yeah. Try it the same way. Put them together. Yeah. Yeah. Almost identical. Pretty much the same really. size, although they're different yeah. makes and different patterns. Yeah. The thing about them is they're sharp straight out the packet, aren't they? I mean, they're yeah. absolutely sharp. These are really sharp, but I would give it a touch on the stone before I used yeah. it anyway. Precisely. And my lead is very similar to yours. Let's just move the, move the rod a bit. Um, almost identical again, isn't it? Surprise, surprise. Little swivel and a, a coffin lead. I haven't got a buffer bead because it... It's got quite a large hole, th hole throughout the yeah, lead, actually, right, isn't it? So yeah. it might not need one. Yeah. I think that buffer bead just protects the knot yeah. a little bit. Yeah. Saves and a bit of wear and tear on it. Quarter round, exactly, of, uh, of weight. That's all you need. And it's yeah. three just to hold the, hold the <coughs> gear on the bottom, give you that little bit of weight for casting. I think, I mean, it would be wrong to suggest that everyone uses this, yeah. you know, this exact right. setup. The yeah. point to make is that this is a tried and tested method and it's, it's worked in a wide variety of situations, yeah. really, isn't it? It's a good all round rig. So that's covered the basic tackle that we use as a, as a general rule. Uh, rods, reels, breaking strains of line, we covered lures, uh, and we looked at the bottom rigs, which are fairly basic. But uh, I mean, that's the, the mainstay of our approach to, to inshore bass fishing, isn't it? Simplicity, I think. I think that's the key, yeah. Uh, it might not work for everybody, that's the key really is to adapt uh, these methods to areas that uh, other people fish. I uh, think the secret is to get to know your own bit of course oh, line. Undoubtedly, fish, yeah. yeah. And to uh, uh, go there and use simple tactics if you can. Yeah. Fish close in and you'll catch a bass. But first find your fish. First find <laughs> Great. A word or two about baits. Generally, a big piece of bait and an appropriately large hook is what's needed. Mackerel head and trailing guts is an excellent bait and is easy to present. Small dead fish like pout or perhaps pollock are best threaded onto the hook, as are sand eels. When you're baiting up with a, a, a long piece of squid like this, I mean, this is a whole squid, so overall it's about sort of seven or eight inches long. I think it's important to put the hook, or the point of the hook, in, in the middle of the bait somewhere. So what I do is just thread it up through the, to the tip of the tail, put it all the way through, and then just nick it about halfway down. Like that. And uh, if the fish picks up the bait across the middle, then it's got the hook in its mouth. If it picks it up at the head end, then uh, obviously once it's got a good good hold of it, it's still likely to have the hook in it. Um, just by hooking it through the tail, I find that they might pick it up by the head, and uh, if they don't wolf it all down, then you end up with um, with a good run, but you don't contact because the hook is probably outside the fish's mouth. It was while using ledged squid in a rough and coloured sea. Steve hooked, landed, and after photographing, he turned a nice bass of eight and a half pounds.
We mentioned earlier that it's sometimes possible to predict where bass will turn up. One of Steve's most reliable spots is made up of ledges and gullies that are covered at high water. As the flooding tide fills the gullies, the bass move in over the ledges. This usually coincides with dusk during early September. Of course, I couldn't make it that evening, so Steve ended up fishing and filming on his own. Half a squid there. Still a little bit frozen, this actually, but it won't make much difference. It soon falls out in this water. There we go. Beat par excellence. Let's give it a bash, eh? Just a gentle lob. Tighten up, just fill the lead then. I think it's about another half an hour before high tide. Yeah, about half an hour. Fish should be moving up above the ledges now, I reckon. Twitches on the line there. They're I mean, very timid these fish, they, they just pluck up the line, or pluck up the bait I should say. All you feel is a, a gentle plucking sensation down the line. Well that's better, it's moving off now. It's definitely moving away with the bait, the fish. Right. It's, it's doing what most of these fish do, and that's run across to the right. There's a big patch of boulders over there. I've got to stop it over there. God, this fish fight like hell in this shallow water. I've stopped it reaching the boulders. Yeah, it's turned now, it's turned. Such a dogless fight. Feels like a good fish. It's been several times. It's difficult to tell when they're in such shallow water. Here. I'll switch the headlamp on. Oh, I saw it then. Oh, it's a good fish. Yes, uh, certainly several times. It's on my side now, oh, that's good. It's a good sign. Oh, a lovely sign. The idea is to try and beat it over the, the ledge now. Thank goodness. Yes. Oh, don't come off, don't come off. Well, there you go, that's a, a lovely fish of about five, five and a half, six pounds, something like that. I caught just over that ledge, a couple of rod lengths out, in barely two, three feet of water. 
It's amazing how, how close in these fish will come, especially in the dark. Um, she's given me a great scrap, so let's pop her back there. Bass are not always so predictable. During midsummer, they're thought to stay well offshore, feeding on shoals of fish. Just look at what we discovered on a calm evening in late July. The two dorsals, yeah, yeah. You can see the front dorsal and every now and yeah. again just the back dorsal, yeah. can't you, yeah? yeah. How peculiar. There's a whole line of fish there, isn't there? Yeah. Despite these fish being present for several days and returning to the same bay a fortnight later, our best efforts with both bait and lure failed to get even one bite. Can anyone tell us where we went wrong?